That's an amazing city. They've been excavating that for many years now. And we'll take you there in just, just a moment. For those of you, maybe this is your first time here, I would remind you that this series of four programs is called Ancient Mysteries Reveal the Future. We are going back to the past to find a source that knows about the future. And so far we've seen that you need two things of a source that suggests that it can tell the future. You need two things. You need historical accuracy meaning it's not fairy tales and myths and legends. And we've shown that a number of times now. Then we've also noticed if you want to know the future of a source, it must be a source that has a good track record of doing that very thing. And so we saw that last night in the second session and just a moment ago from ancient civilizations. But now we're going to show you in this last session that it even tells us what's happening today from way back. So that's what we'll see, a clear example from 2,000 years ago of some predictions about the times that we're living in that were made so long ago. When you come to Pompeii, it was a rather large city for ancient times, a city given to pleasure, to wealth. It was a holiday city for many of the ancient Romans, much, I guess, like some cities we have today where people come at summertime and the population increases of some of our towns around New South Wales and so on on the coast. They had large homes and running water, piped water to many of the homes in Pompeii. You could come here to the forum, the marketplace if you will. Maybe you want to come to the places where you deal with the money and the money changes and get some money out for the day so you could go do some shopping. You would come here to this amazing place to the wool merchants, ladies, I'm sorry, but back in those days, you, a lot of you had to make your own clothes for the family. So buy some wool to do some, some uh, uh, weaving for your family. You could come here to the bakery to buy the bread. Uh, if you wanted to, you could also come here to the Kentucky Fried Place or Macca's because this was like food on the run servery here. There's a lot of these places as you wander around Pompeii where people could buy food at these stalls here. Then, of course, if in the afternoon, if you were sort of wanting to come and watch your favourite drama live, you could come here to the theatre because they were great into acting and drama back then. If you were the more sporty type, you could come here to the great theatre, the sports arena, and watch the gladiators kill each other. Entertainment in Rome was not what we would call vicarious, where we watched people act it out. That was the real thing in Rome and this was one of the factors that caused Rome to disintegrate. The people, the citizens of the Roman Empire fed on violence. A society cannot feed on violence and it not affect that society, which is a warning to our civilization today. But this is what happened in ancient Rome. Thousands of people would gather in these arenas just to watch people fight and the blood flow. And if the fight was a good one and the man on the ground was about to be killed by his opponent, people might put thumbs up. It was worth him living. If they put thumbs down, that was the end of the poor guy who lost the fight. He would be run through with the sword. They would have pitched naval battles and all sorts of things in their arenas. Well, in the evening, you could come to the bathhouse and you could relax. You know, they had warm, hot, cold baths and so on there in Rome. You can still see how they made these things work in many of the excavations around the Middle East today. A place to live it up. Other people had other things to do at night time. They would come to the brothels. You could see the signs of the brothels there in the streets of Pompeii. There are some images that are, were on the walls of the homes and the villas of Pompeii that we could never show in a program like this. You can see it in the Naples Museum some of the things, Pompeii was a city given to pleasure and materialism and fun. But always in the background, oh, by the way, I was reading an article just a few, uh, just a couple of years ago about this graffiti that was on one of the walls of the homes of Sodom, of, of Pompeii, Sodom and Gomorrah, someone had scribbled scribbled on there way back in those days. And archaeologists believe that obviously Jews lived here because that's a Jewish story. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah because of what was taking place in that terrible city and someone had scrawled it on the walls here. 
Well, as I said, they also had their temples. I guess they needed some religion to keep their conscience okay, but not too much religion to spoil your fun. But religion never spoiled people's fun in the ancient world because, as I said to some folk out there, you could go to the temple and you have the temple prostitutes to serve you, male and female, and especially in Baal worship before this time. But religion in the ancient world pampered to the lusts of people back in those days. But always in the background was this sleeping volcano, if we could call it that, Mount Vesuvius. It had not been active for some 700 years. And then finally in AD 64, the Mount Vesuvius rumbled, caused an earthquake that destroyed much of this city. But the people of Pompeii started to rebuild it again and they carried on business as usual, failing to listen to the warning signs that Mount Vesuvius was giving. In AD 79, Mount Vesuvius started to rumble yet again, but the people carried on business as usual. Going down to the marketplace, going down to the theatres and carrying on their business, not listening to the warnings until finally that fateful day on August 24, AD 79, Mount Vesuvius just blew its top and it rained red hot pumice on the city of Pompeii for three days and completely buried it. And other cities like Herculaneum around the bay as well. What a great tragedy that was. A city that was buried, and archaeologists have been excavating this for many years now, started well, over 200 years ago, been excavating this old city. A city that failed to heed the warning signs that they've dug up the last tragic moments of a city that did not listen. And they found these, what looked like bubbles, and when they poured in plaster of Paris and so on, they discovered that these were the contorted bodies of the people trapped in their final moments before they died a city that failed to heed the warning signs in many respects. Let's go back to Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. In our last session, you will remember, we saw very clearly that Jesus the Christ made these amazing predictions concerning Jerusalem, the city, its temple and its people. All of them fulfilled very precisely the exact fulfilment made 2,000 years ago and yet predicting the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. We saw how accurate that was. The disciples, the followers of Jesus, asked a question and he answered part of it that we saw, but there was a second part to their question. Tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? Now, we didn't take that part yet, but we're going to move into that bit now. We've certainly seen that Jesus got it right with the destruction of Jerusalem, what took place. What about the end of the world? What did he have to say about that? on this occasion. We're going to see some amazing high octane prophecies made from 2000 years ago that almost read like the Sydney Morning Herald or what you'd see on nightly news here in Sydney. You would think this had been written just yesterday, but it wasn't. It was 2000 years ago. We're going to see that in actual fact, looking at last night's prediction from the prophet from the book of Daniel, we are on the knife edge of eternity as a civilization. If we're going to take this seriously and the ability of these prophets and uh, to make these predictions. First of all, he talked about signs in the natural world, signs in the things that happen around us in nature. Notice he talked about earthquakes back then. There will be earthquakes in various places. Now, some people don't realise that earthquakes are increasing on the planet today. I've done the research on it myself and found that that's exactly the case. You think of some of the horrific earthquakes we have had. I was back in two or three years ago in the city of Christchurch, a city that's had the heart of it ripped out because of that earthquake in which in one building alone over 100 people were killed. Most of them, many of them, Japanese students. A tragic event there. But of course, worse earthquakes than that, we've had Haiti with over 200,000 pe people killed. Then we have the, notice some of these statistics here. 
the first 10 years of last century, there were 18 recorded quakes over six that were actually recorded. When we come on down the last 10 years of the 20th century, we have 42 recorded quakes over six by the end of that century. When we come to the first 10 years of this century, there have been 217 earthquakes over seven. Six is too small now. Now we're measuring them over the seven factor. Massive earthquakes are starting to take place. You think, by the way, of the number of deaths that are increasing. Some 500,000 deaths from earthquakes in the last, I think it's 10 year period. Enormous a number of, of, of uh, tragedies as a result of this. Jesus talked about famines. He said there will be famines, talking about before the end of time. Now I want you to think about this for just a moment. You know, some 24,000 people, children mainly, die from hunger. You think about it. That's one every roughly three seconds a child died. Another one has just died. Another one. That is tragic, isn't it? And much of this could be prevented but for the greed of first world countries if we put our mind to it. Jesus was right. There will be famines. You think about it, 500 plus million people go to bed hungry or only have one meal a day. Desperate for one meal, that is. You think about this, 925 million go to bed hungry every night. We don't go to bed hungry in this country, do we? <laughs> we probably have too many meals. <laughs> Sometimes it's five or six meals a day, you know, the one in the middle of the day and so on. But here, what a tragedy. Jesus indicated tsunamis and cyclones and floods. He talked about this regarding nature's things. There will be distress of nations with perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring. I think he got that one right, didn't he? We understand what a tsunami is. We are horrified by those images that came out of the Southern Asian tsunami a few years ago where those waves just rolled over. I had a friend here in Sydney who was one of the few Australians sent in to bring relief, medical people. It just sh shattering to see what took place there on the ground. And he gave us a report of some of those things. Nations are anxious about such terrifying events. Jesus almost indicated we'd sort of be caught with a global cardiac arrest. The nation's worried and anxious. And that is true today, isn't it? Gosh, you, you ask any people today in in various areas of our world in terms of politicians and law enforcers, they don't know what to do. Just watching the other day, they're, they're, how do you stop some of this stuff that's happening in our world today? How do you rein in terrorism? It's not going to get better, my friend. We want to think it would, but listen, it, it just breeds more. That's the tragedy. Jesus was right. He predicted with 100% accuracy. Jesus talked about, number two, signs in the political world, the world of military and politics and so on. He said, you will hear of wars and rumours of wars in the world toward the end of time. Do you know, roughly in our world, every year there are 30 wars going on. Some of them we don't even think about. But that's what's happening across our planet. In fact, we spend $100 million on war every hour on this planet. Now, when you think about it, we spend 80 times more on war than we do on water and sanitation. That's where our priorities are. Killing each other rather than helping each other. These are the statistics. It's very real. We have 27,000 nuclear bombs in stock. We don't need half that amount to do the job, to finish off the world. But that's the way humanity has been going and Jesus was right. He talked about international global conflicts. Jesus said these words, 2,000 years ago, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. You think about that. The nations, John says in the Revelation, in the centre of his book, as he begins to peel back the scenes of the planet, 
today, and he does. We don't have time to go there, but one of the things he says, the nations were angry. You think last century we had 180 million deaths from war alone related to war. Yet that century began with people saying we have entered a new age of peace. You read your history and you'll find the 19th century as they began it, they thought it was going to be the best and we were ushering in a new world. But it became the most tragic century of history. 180 million deaths from war alone. We think about nuclear conflict. <laughs> We're really worried about this one. And of course, uh, uh, Osama has gone. But those who are part of that scene, they multiply. And scientists and politicians are worried. What if one of these guys can get hold of one of these dirty bombs? That is a real worry today among leaders of the world. What happens if they get hold of one of these things, which is why they're trying to keep it out of Iran, because yeah, the Iranians, government maybe, but what happens if some of the people who uh, you know, believe some of the things that's going on in our world, a terrorist uh, suddenly takes over? What then? Where are we going to be? And of course, Israel and, and Iran. What a tragic scene that is. You know, I've been studying the history. I take people to Iran. And the Iranians were the people who helped the Israelis to survive. And tragically today, the Israelis want to destroy them. And I guess they have some good reasons to fear, of course. But what a different thing has happened today from where it once was, where the Iranian people under Cyrus and other people, the Persians, saved the Israel, Israelites from complete holocaust on one occasion. Twice, I should say. Signs in the social world Jesus talked about. Signs in the world of human relationships. Jesus says, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. In other words, as we leave, move toward the end of time, we will find we live in a loveless age. We might talk about love, but is it the real deal? Is it really genuine love? Or more about what I can get out of a relationship. Paul a friend of Jesus the Christ, you would think he'd sort of plagiarised the Sydney Morning Herald. Watch what he wrote 2,000 years ago. But know this, he says to his friend Timothy, who's writing to you, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money. Heard of GFC? His econo economists tell us that one of the reasons for the GFC, one of the prime reasons was human greed. Boasters. Proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God and having a form of godliness but actually denying its power. Whoa, that's, he got that one right. All well, those things, a litany of them there. Now, you think of violence today in our world. I have just noticed, we used to live in the United States of America for a little while and we used to watch the Chicago News and our family got to call that channel the one that you used to see, the murder channel, because it was just one after another after another. Back here in Australia when I was growing up, murders were on the front page because they were infrequent, at least in Perth. But today, come on, give me a break. You'll find them down on page 8, 9, 10, domestic violence and people kill. It's a tragedy what is taking place today in our world. If you don't believe it, let's have a look at the top problems in the 1940s in the schools. So some of you wind back 40 years or more. No, that's only more than that, isn't it? Probably not too many of us can wind back that far. But these were the top problems in the 1940s. Let's have a look at them. Number one, talking in the class. Classroom, chewing gum in the schoolroom, making a noise in the classroom, running in the halls of the schools, cutting in line and not wearing your school uniform and finally throwing paper around. They're serious issues, aren't they? <laughs> Terrible stuff. Let's wind it on into the 2000s. Here are the top problems today at schools in Australia as well. Drug use by school kids, alcohol abuse. Oh, happens every Christmas time, especially just at the end of the year, doesn't it? And not only just at the end of the year, pregnancy among school kids, suicide tragically. 
because homes are being bombarded today, kids committing suicide, rape by school kids, robbery and assault. You would think you are living on a different planet and all that within the space of 60 years, even in our own country. Now, some of you who maybe can remember a few years ago, now when I was a kid growing up in the city of Perth, we used to sleep outside under the stars in the summer because it's like 30 degrees or more in the summer. You wouldn't really do that today if you've got any brains, probably. Not in the city of Perth. Because times have changed. An 80-year-old woman today in some of our cities has two or three deadlocks lest a 13-year-old rape her. That's happened in our country. That's the reality. Something has happened and Jesus got it right. It will be, tragically, a loveless age. Do you know in our country, one in six boys and one in four girls will be sexually abused before the age of 18? That's not love in anybody's language. And we have been seeing this thing playing out in the last couple of years, haven't we? It's a tragedy. But Jesus said, a loveless age. Jesus also talked about signs in the religious world. He gave a, a number of indicators of what would be taking place. Beware of false prophets. You will know them by their fruits, he said. People who claim to be sort of self-appointed messiahs and prophets and so on. Now, you, we've seen some of these cults in recent times, fairly recent times, we had that Jim Jones cult where 900 people committed suicide in a religious pact. And then, of course, David Koresh back in Waco where 70 odd people were killed in a shootout with the police and so on. And then the Jewish messiahs, we've had those down through time. Many people today claiming to be prophets and so on, even among Christianity, we see some of these things taking place. Here's one. Now, please don't get me wrong. I'm not fighting or arguing for or against Darwinian evolution or creation. I'm not arguing either that here. But what I want you to know is somebody knew something 2,000 years ago. You see, back 200 years ago, maybe 300 years ago, almost everybody on planet Earth believed in some sort of a creator God, right? That's my point. Even the scientists like Sir Isaac Newton, the great scientists, they believed in a creator God. But today, most of the Western world does not believe that. And yet somebody predicted that 2,000 years ago. Let me put it up for you. Peter was the man. Peter wrote, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, and this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old. Now, as I said, I'm not arguing for or against creation versus evolution. I'm simply saying somebody got it right. Somebody predicted at a time when almost everybody believed in a creator God that when we come to the end of time, there would be a great disbelief in that idea. That's the point we're making here. The prophecies of the Bible are dependable. But not only that, Jesus spoke of the spread of the gospel or the, the message of God's love for people is what the gospel is called. Notice what he said. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations and then the end will come. Now Time magazine, I mean Secular Time magazine wrote an article on this very thing. A couple of them I think it was. I saw, read one of them but I heard of uh, some, another article and uh, and they said these words, if people who are Christians believe the prophecies of Jesus and his words, then they would understand that therefore we are much closer to the end than they realise. Why? Because they gave a report of how Christianity had been spreading like wildfire around the world. For example, here's... Front cover story, Time magazine. Adherence to that faith, meaning Christianity, have more than tripled all across Asia since 1970, jumping from just over 100 million to over 350 million in Asia alone. Now, not only that, but we can see this has been happening in places like South America, the Philippines and Africa. Those countries have been booming with the spread of the gospel and the number of people 
who are accepting the messages of Jesus. In India is a surprising one. It's one of the fastest growing places for the Christian message today is India of all places. Unbelievable. One of the fastest. In fact, I think it peaked the fastest place at one occasion. All right. And you can see many people, not just in India, but in various places in the world today. Russia, when the communism collapsed, many people were hungry for something better in life. And thousands of people found a new way of living back in these various countries or are. Now, there are the warning signs, my friend. Jesus talked about four specific areas. Signs, he said, in the natural world. And we can see that taking place. Signs, he said, in the political world. Signs, number three, in the social world. And finally, in the religious world. And we've just taken a snapshot of those things. But you can see very clearly today. I mean, on top of that, there's a whole book of Revelation which just boggles your mind to see what's taking place as a result uh, or in accordance with those predictions. Now, what do they all mean? What do all these predictions mean? Well, it comes back to what Jesus said. Jesus said, when you see all these things, know that it, meaning his coming, because that was the question. What is the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? Know that it is near, even at the doors. Now you think of that prediction we saw last evening, where Daniel, 2,500 years ago, predicted the rise and fall of four empires. And we saw that in our first session. He mentions them by name. On top of that, we have very specific predictions of what will be taking place in the end of time. And we are there. We are at that point in Earth's history. So what should our reaction be? Should we sort of bite our fingernails and hide in the corner? Was that the idea? No, it was not. I want you to notice what Jesus said as he finished off talking to his followers. He said, now when these things begin to happen, when you see these things, he said, look up, lift up your heads. Why? Because your redemption draws near. What did he mean by that? Well, he simply meant, this is because God's empire is about to take over that we saw last evening from Daniel. Soon God will usher in a new world where, as we saw last evening, there will be no more tears. There will be no more pain. There will be no more death. What a world that will be, my friends. You think about it. Those things what we, we, we understand the world to be today, but that is not going to be the end. The best is yet to come, and it's going to come when Jesus the Christ returns. And so it was that on August 24, AD 79, Mount Vesuvius woke to a new day of life. People left their homes in that busy city. They came to do business as usual down in the Forum. Some people, they did their business down in the sports arena. Some people came here, no doubt, to visit the psychics because the psychics were supposed to be able to tell the future from the dust patterns in their bowls and basins in some ancient civilizations. They couldn't even tell what was going to happen in a couple of hours and then it happened. Mount Vesuvius blew its top and it began to rain that red hot pumice on the city. Some of the people tried to get out of the city gate here, but tragically they left it too late and they were trapped in this city at the gates. And they found the people 2,000 years later nearly. The tragedy of not listening to the warning signs you can imagine as we let our imagination flow what must have been happening in this place. You can imagine somebody comes here to get their bread from the baker's shop. Well, they found the bread 2,000 years later. But the people who came for the bread, they perished in Pompeii. You can almost imagine the priests, they raced back to the temple to get some of their sacred objects, their relics of religious purposes. But they left it too late. And they perished in Pompeii. The tragedy of not listening to the warning signs. <laughs> what about this? This is the house of Pansus. 
You can almost imagine. This guy goes back to get some of his art that decorates his home, but he left it too late and perished with the others in Pompeii. You know, this is the tragedy of not listening to the warning signs. And as a civilization, we have been given many warning signs from Jesus the Christ and the other Bible prophets. So the question, I guess, is are we listening? Are we listening to the warning signs or are we going to be like the people of Pompeii in our world? What should we do? How then should we act? Now, I want you to notice what Jesus said. He said, as he signed off, but watch yourselves in, ca in case your heart, your mind, be weighed down with partying, drunkenness and the cares of this life. And he said, that day come on you unexpectedly. In other words, he said, this is not a time for party on dude sort of stuff. This is a time for sober thinking and sober reflection and serious living and thinking about what is about to happen and how we can be prepared for what is about to happen. So the question as we sign off is this, how can we be a citizen in that last empire? Because it's coming. It's coming. And we've only seen a couple of prophecies. I mean, we have a seminar coming up that we'll talk about in a moment where they're going to be digging even deeper. It's amazing what you find in the book of Daniel there about the times in which we're living. So how can we be in that last empire where there'll be no more tears, no more war, no more pain, no more of those horrible things, no more depression, no more disease, no more divorce, no more death. That's the world we need today. It really is. And it's coming because the, the, you remember last night, Daniel said, it's sure, it's true, you can trust it. And that was part of that last empire. Let me share with you just what I discovered myself I mentioned uh, a moment ago, uh, Matthew, you were asking me how come I got into doing this stuff. Let me tell you how. I started studying medicine at the West Australian University back a long time ago now. <laughs> and uh, as I began studying medicine for the first time in my life as a 19 year old, I began to wonder about the big questions in life. I guess that's a, probably a time in our life when we start to think about those things. Is there anybody out there? Is there a God? Um, is the world, is anybody in control of this thing? Or are we just drifting along aimlessly? So I began to seek for answers to those questions. The big issues of life, when we get to death's door itself, what's beyond when I come to the end? Where have I come from? Where are we going? Is there a hope for the future? These were the questions that were starting to come to my mind as I began studying university there in Western Australia. And I began to look at archaeology. I began to examine ancient civilizations. And as I saw that, I realised, well, at least this book, it's not a bunch of fairy tales, just like we've seen in the last couple of days. It's not that. It's, not, it's something you can trust historically. And then as I dug into some of these ancient prophecies of ancient civilizations, I saw, hello, whoever predicted these things, they must have got some insight from somewhere. You cannot predict the destruction of Tyre. You cannot predict the destruction of ancient Babylon and Assyria and Nineveh, because that's what's in this book. 90% of the predictions deal with ancient civilization. You cannot get it right again and again and again, but something must be behind this thing. So I began to realise, well, maybe there is a God. Someone's giving some insights. And then I remember hearing an incredible story at that time in my life. And uh, I want to bring that to you. I want to just put that back on again. For I want to take people to Jerusalem for a moment. If you could. It doesn't matter too much. All right, let me tell you. When you visit Jerusalem today, you come to two amazing sites in Jerusalem. Both purport to be the place where Jesus the Christ was crucified after this event that we've seen. He made these predictions. One is called uh, Gordon's Calvary. It looks like a skull. We know archaeologically that that's not the place because it's, it's, it's just not the right time. Uh, the second one is at a place called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, this could be the place because... It was outside the walls of Jerusalem. Archaeologists have worked that out. 
Now, it could be the place, but who knows where it really was, but it was there somewhere. Anyway, I remember hearing about this when I was going at this time in my life, and uh, the guy talked about the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, we've all heard about the crucifixion of Jesus. Hollywood made it famous through a couple of years, a few years ago now, isn't it? The Passion of the Christ. It was an horrific picture, wasn't it? I mean, he was beaten to a pulp. You remember the picture. Mel Gibson's Hollywood blockbuster film. And uh, by the way, archaeologists have discovered amazing evidence for crucifixion from the first century. They were, well, some workmen were working on a road some years ago and they discovered the bones of a man who had a nail through his ankle. And he was a man from the first century who had been crucified because the Romans were big into that. When the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, they crucified scores of people around the hills of Jerusalem. So I was at a, I was at a meeting for young people on one occasion and, and I was sitting there. My life was out of control. I had no meaning in life at this time. I had no purpose. I had no hope for the future. I was sort of scared stiff about all the sort of stuff we've talked about this afternoon. Where are we heading? And as I was sitting there, the guy said, you know, 2,000 years ago, there was a man who died on a cross. And he, and, he, and he talked about that event. And I remembered it that, uh, remember reading about how there was a guy on the cross next to Jesus. If you've ever read the story of the crucifixion, you'll notice this is what took place. There were two criminals next to each other and both of these men made fun of the Christ at that time. They both said, oh, come on, if you're the Christ, get off the cross and help us. So they made fun of him, both of them. But after a while, one of them realised game was up. He was facing the grim ripper. Death itself. So this guy, as he's, as he's there, he begins to think, where am I headed? And uh, his mate was just mocking Christ on the middle cross and, and he turned to him and he said, come on, man, get real. I mean, we, we're in the same position as this guy. I mean, the three of us are going to die soon. We deserve what we're getting. This is what he said. But this guy, he's done nothing wrong. And then, of all things, he turned to Jesus and he said these words, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, why did he say that? Because over the head of Jesus, Pilate, a Roman, a Roman leader, a, a governor, had put the words in Hebrew and Latin and in Greek, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And as this guy had heard Jesus all that day, they'd walked the street together down the Via Dolorosa and he'd heard Jesus stop to some weeping women and say, don't cry for me, cry for yourselves because I can see what's coming home to you people. He, he, remembered, he remembered that when they nailed him to the cross, he repeated in the Greek language again and again, forgive them, forgive them, forgive them. I mean... He's talking about the guys who nailed him. And he's, he begins to think, what, what's going And then he realised the man on the middle cross was God in human flesh. And that's why he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You're the king of that last empire. That's who you are. And you're taking the place of every man, woman and child. He says, Lord, remember me. Now you can imagine a pin, you could have heard a pin drop that day. I mean, how is Jesus the Christ going to speak to this man who's been mocking him, making fun of him like the other guy and everybody else? How's he going to answer this guy? I guess if it was you or me, well, I can only speak for myself. I would have said, forget it, buddy. <laughs> Give me a break. But he didn't. As quick as a flash, Jesus said these words, truly. I mean, he spoke with such certainty. Like Daniel the prophet, this is for sure. He said, truly. I'm telling you on this day, on this horrible day, when it looks like I'm, I'm finished, I'm telling you, in fact, he's saying, because of this day, you will be with me in that last empire. Now, I don't know. That's got to be grace. <laughs> That's the way that hymn says it, that we're hit number one on the hit parade. It's amazing grace that God would respond to a man who'd done all that stuff to him. Well, I heard that story, and basically I said, God, my life is a mess. Help me. And he did. He just changed my life. Let me tell you. And now I, I thank 
God for that book because it's given me hope for the future, a purpose for living and a peace of mind that, that comes to a, a human being. And that's what we desperately need in our world today.